Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, the last session of the day, and thank you for making it here. Congratulations to you all for making it here. The title of the session is Be Moved by Statistics, but the full quote is, the mark of a truly intelligent person is to be moved by statistics. So the fact that you have all moved from the coffee area to here suggests you're all highly intelligent people already. So congratulations for that. I'm really excited about this session. Um, my name is Anthony Dottin. I uh, have been working in the field of advocacy and global health for the last number of years, and I'm really humbled to be working uh, and, and hearing the presentation of, of Catherine, Jennifer, and Teo later on. I'm just going to run through a few introductory remarks. And those coming in, please come forwards in the room. It's not a, a, a full room, it's a big room, so please come forwards and uh, make us feel like we're popular. So. Statistics can be quite a, a daunting word, and, and data in particular can be sort of quite a, a difficult thing. So I want to, first of all, say I am by no means a statistician. I know very, very little about statistics, but I've used it a lot in my work. And in the last few years, I've really realized the value that it can potentially bring to work that we're doing in advocacy, but also looking at our own programs and understanding about perhaps what we need to be doing. I want to give a little bit of a background and, and have you think about this whilst the, the presenters are talking about things. Because for those who don't know, this is the WHO's model of the building blocks of a health system. Service delivery, health workforce, essential medicines, financing, leadership and governance. And this one here, health information systems. Every single health system and health service should be collecting detailed health information and using that. And what we're really wanting to challenge today is, are you using that to the fullest degree? Are you contributing to that health information system? Do you know what's being collected? Do you take what's being collected and have it to inform your practice? And hopefully today, we're gonna to be having you stimulate some questions around those areas and, and think about some of those things. So I had a bit of a brainstorm, and for me, the value of statistics, I can simplify into three areas how they've been useful for me. First of all, in decision-making, and having data-driven decision-making. Data-driven is growing as a word, as a buzzword in the community, that every decision that is being made has to have data behind it. So statistics give us that data-driven decision-making. Secondly, they help us see things that maybe we don't see right in front of us. So looking at statistics can help us see perhaps what isn't apparent and perhaps what we're missing from our work that we need to be addressing a little bit more. And thirdly and most importantly, and I'm going to bring an example around this, the motto of the previous WHO Secretary General, Margaret Chan, was what gets measured gets done. And this is a real mantra now that what does get me measured gets done. And I learned this myself in a presentation that I gave a few years ago to a health community. There was no rehabilitation actors in the room, and I was talking about non-communicable diseases, and I could see that I didn't have the room. People really didn't understand why, in a session about diabetes, in about cardiovascular disease, about other things, why was this physiotherapist stood in front of people and talking about rehabilitation? And I put up a statistic, I put up a piece of data, and instantly the room changed, and this was it. Every 20 seconds, a lower limb is lost to diabetes somewhere in the world. And this was a light bulb phone moment for me because I could feel the room change. I could feel people suddenly connecting what I had been talking about. Suddenly in front of them was a very tangible example of, wow, nobody's ever talked about that before. Nobody's ever talked. They've talked about diet causing diabetes and they've talked about different things, but nobody's talked about this implication of people living with diabetes and suddenly it changed uh, my view on how we can use statistics and, and grow forwards. So today we're gonna to be talking about three areas. And like I say, I'm very excited about the three presenters that we've got. First of all, we're gonna be thinking about how we as physiotherapists find and use data and statistics to understand our context and respond to the needs. And I'm very pleased that by Weblink, we've got Theo Voss of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation who is working on a program called the Global Burden of Disease and really leads on elements around disability and non-fatal outcomes. And he's gonna be showing us through live feed some amazing statistics and visualization of what's happening, global trends that are happening and what impact that that might have on physiotherapy and how us as physiotherapists can access data like that to help us understand what is happening in 
not only the world, but the region and the countries that we're working in. Secondly, we're going to challenge you to think about how we as physiotherapists can collect data and tools to collect data to, under to understand and improve our own practice. And Catherine Sykes has been working um, with the WCPT. Many of you may know her from the WCPT and has uh, become an expert, a global expert on the ICF and other tools. So she's going to guide us through a few tools that we could, should, uh, and maybe can incorporate into our practice that will really help to us to understand and improve that. And finally, I'm going to challenge us to use how we can use our collected data to promote and, exter uh, to promote and externalize our work for external audiences. How can we use the data that we collect to advocate for what we do? And Jennifer Gelsmer of the University of Cape Town is going to talk to us about a program that's local to here that she used to support the practice of physiotherapy in a service here. So hopefully these three different but connected areas will help us think about that. Finally, I want you to enjoy the session. A couple of housekeeping pieces. We're going to go from one straight into the next program. So we're going to do three speak speeches um, back to back. Um, and then have time for reflections, for comments and discussion at the end of that. Because Theo is joining us by webcast, he's, he's live and he's going to stay on the whole time. And we thank him for joining from Seattle at 7 o'clock in the morning or something there. So if you see him drinking a coffee, or um, then, then, then understand that it's very early in the morning there. And we're grateful for him to come over. Um, if you do have questions at the end, um, because it's a, a slight delayed link, then I'll repeat them back so that I make sure that everybody's understood those questions. So um, if you could come to the front and, 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 and ask those questions, or the microphone will come around, and then I'll repeat that back. So without further ado, I'm gonna, there's going to be a little delay as we connect to Teo. And uh, Teo, feel free to take it away. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Uh, let's see if we can uh, start to make this work. I'm going to share my screen. And that means, if we're lucky, you're now looking at my slide deck. Is that correct? Yeah, we've got you. Great. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about this very large project called the Global Burden of Disease, which is a public good that we are producing for the world to use for decision making on health. So I'll give you a little overview and how it has evolved over time, uh, but uh, spend a uh, uh, more time towards the end, uh, showing you some of the fantastic uh, visualization uh, tools uh, that uh, are freely available online. So Global Burden of Disease is a systematic scientific effort to quantify the comparative magnitude of health loss from all major diseases, injuries and risk factors by age, sex and population and over time. And we aim to inform decision makers at every level, local, regional, national, and global, the best possible evidence on the levels of disease, the trends, and the drivers of health, so that decisions are ultimately more evidence-based. Currently, we cover 195 countries and territories, and we make estimates from 1990 to the present. Uh, quite a few countries are uh, subdivided, uh, and we aim to do that for every country with a population greater than 200 million. But we also, through contacts with um, uh, ministries of health, uh, have added uh, subnational estimates for a number of other countries, as you can see listed on the slide. Um, we currently make estimates for 325 diseases and injuries, over two and a half thousand what we call sequela or consequences of those uh, diseases, 79 risk factors and clusters of risk factors. We make annual updates and in September uh, you can expect the next round of estimates which we have called GBD 2016. Um, the findings are published in uh, medical and public health journals, we make policy reports, but most importantly, we have all the information available in online data visualization tools. 
So what do we measure? Uh, we measure all the traditional metrics. Uh, so the prevalence, incidence of diseases, injuries, the death numbers and the rates thereof. But importantly, to make things comparable, we translate all of those into a measure of time. So for deaths, we measure the health loss as years of life lost, where, where we count the number of years lost at each age, at, at, for a death at each age, compared to a reference life expectancy, which we currently set at 86 and a half years at birth. But as we use a life table, uh, we still uh, award a number of years of life lost to a death at any age. And believe it or not, at age 110, you would still have uh, a year and a half of uh, years of life lost when you die. Um, importantly, we add uh, in years lived with disability. So for every disease and consequence of disease, by age, by sex, we measure the prevalence, how many people in a country in a particular year uh, have this uh, condition, and then we weight it by a value between zero and one, which we call a disability weight that indicates the relative severity of that uh, condition. And then we simply add up the years of life lost and the years lived with disability, and then we get our main metric of the DALIs that define uh, the burden of disease. By blending the information on years lived with this disability with uh, the life expectancy, we can also calculate a health-adjusted life expectancy, uh, which is a, a positive summary measure uh, of health uh, for a population. We do this work in collaboration with a growing number of uh, uh, co-investigators. We currently have uh, 2,300 uh, plus uh, people around the world who contribute to, to this uh, large project. And you can see that we are slowly filling the map uh, of the world uh, and we are actively uh, pursuing um, you know, finding collaborators uh, in every uh, location uh, across the globe. So what is it based on? Well, just a snapshot of what data we use. We have uh, information on over 600 million death certificates from 1980 onwards. Uh, to supplement that in countries where there isn't a, a functional vital registration system, we make use of 530 verbal autopsy studies. We have access to a large number of household surveys with microdata that we can analyze ourselves. And we also rely on systematic reviews of the literature, and we currently have over 14,000 studies uh, that we access and we extract data on things like incidence, prevalence, case fatality rates, severity distributions. We also make use of uh, a large number of administrative data sources on, say, national accounts, health service encounter data, uh, infectious disease reports, uh, small-scale service claims data. We have collated all that information in a, a large uh, data exchange called GHDX. It's uh, also accessible by anyone, and it provides all the sources uh, that uh, are in the GBD and uh, metadata on each of those uh, sources. So a valuable resource for anyone interested in health in the world. But, you know, there are lots of challenges in trying to make sense of the available information that we have, disease by disease and cause of death by cause of death. So there are many challenges in inconsistent coding, different case definitions, not having any data at all, uh, data that are conflicting, uh, prevalence and incidence estimates that don't talk to each other, or for the same location, uh, wildly varying uh, prevalence uh, estimates. 
there's the sampling error, but much more important, uh, the non-sampling measurement uh, error that uh, uh, determines a lot of the variation in estimates uh, between locations and over time. And there often are groups in populations that uh, are excluded uh, from, uh, from measurements. So our main solutions to these problems are to do a, uh, a quality review of all sources. And uh, for causes of death, we have a, an extensive system of what we call corrections for garbage coding, where uh, there are lots of codes that don't give a, a clear idea of the true underlying cause of death. And we do a lot of rearranging of those codes uh, so that uh, they fit more with underlying uh, causes that uh, are meaningful to policy. For the non-fatal work, we do a lot of what we call crosswalking, uh, where we try to make studies more comparable by adjusting for different case definitions, technologies, recall periods. Um, all of that we do using statistical methods. Similarly, we use statistical methods to fill in gaps to deal with missing data, to deal with inconsistencies, the excluded groups and measurement error. Uh, a little bit about the structure. So we have a hierarchy of diseases, injuries, and then these consequences of disease or sequela. So we have four levels of our disease and injury hierarchy, and then uh, the sequela underneath uh, the, those. And each of those sequela, um, uh, are mutually exclusive so that the sum of those add up to the total amount of non-fatal health loss uh, for a particular cause. Impairments such as vision loss, motor impairment, intellectual disability um, are assigned to their underlying causes. Um, so to give you an example, uh, I've given you one drill down in the hierarchy where we have at level one, the broad grouping of communicable maternal neonatal uh, conditions and nutritional deficiencies. Second level is the collation of a whole lot of infectious diseases. Meningitis at the third level is one of those, where we then at the fourth level break it down by different uh, etiologies of meningitis, such as pneumococcal meningitis, and then the non-fatal estimates are determined by each of those sequelae. And I've just mentioned two of those for pneumococcal meningitis. I think we make estimates for 18 different uh, uh, consequences of meningitis. And uh, the ones I've lifted out are severe motor impairment due to pneumococcal meningitis and profound hearing loss. Then each of those sequela is associated with a health state for which we have one of these magical numbers between zero and one that determine the relative severity. And uh, for recent versions of the global burden of disease, we've made use of uh, large population surveys in which we ask respondents to do pairwise comparisons uh, based on simple language descriptions of two health states where we then ask, who is the healthier? It's maybe a bit like what you did as kids. Would you rather be deaf than blind? Um, it's similar sort of as, uh, kind of question. We have from nine uh, country surveys and an internet survey, we have more than 60,000 respondents who uh, answered 10 to 15 of these uh, pairwise comparison uh, questions, and these pairs are randomly selected. There's a large difference in the, in the, num in the people who took part. The internet survey, uh, more than 95% of people have tertiary education, whereas in uh, country surveys, uh, education level was a lot less. And for instance, in Tanzania, um, less than 50% of the sample had secondary education or more. Nevertheless, we found great consistency in findings between those surveys. And we think that probably has to do with our particular focus on health. 
asking who is the healthier rather than general well-being. We don't ask who is better off. And just to give you an indication of the range of uh, these values, so between a value of zero, which would indicate no disability and maximum disability at one, uh, you can see a wide range of values. Uh, the lowest disability weight is for mild anemia at uh, four out of 0.4% health loss, whereas active psychosis in schizophrenia uh, is awarded a 77% uh, health loss during the time that people uh, stay in that health state. Okay, let me now move on to showing you some uh, results. So I'm going to shift uh, to our visualization tools. Um, let me... Okay. Are you seeing what we call a tree map in front of you? Um, yeah, we've got this. Is, we've got that okay, this is a rectangular version of the pie chart uh, that uh, you saw in uh, anthony's uh, uh, cartoon um and let me simplify it a bit so first of all if we look at the the highest level in our hierarchy we have these communicable diseases maternal neonatal we have non-communicable diseases and injuries and this is the distribution of deaths in the world in, nine, in 2015. If we go back to 1990, uh, then it should shift, but it's being slow. Let me see. Oh, there we go. Okay, so in, in 1990, you can see that the... Uh, estimates of group one in the orangey colors were much larger and uh, the non-communicable diseases were a smaller proportion of total deaths in the world. And that is an important thing to note that uh, there's been a shift away from these poverty-related infectious maternal neonatal nutritional deficiency diseases towards the non-communicable diseases. If we then translate the deaths into years of life lost, then you can see that the picture changes. Childhood deaths count as a greater amount of health loss when we translate it into years of life lost than the non-communicable disease deaths that largely affected the elderly. And we can put a lot more detail into this for all the underlying causes. And then you can see here, ischemic heart disease and stroke, and on, among the infectious diseases, lower respiratory infections, diarrhea, HIV, TB. If we shift this to YLDs, so the non-fatal component, you see quite a different distribution. Many, many more non-communicable diseases, much smaller contribution from the infectious diseases, and actually the biggest in this group one category is iron deficiency anemia, not an infectious disease, but a nutritional deficiency. And then you see things coming up that uh, you never see when you look at mortality only, back and neck pain, depression, anxiety, sense organ diseases, which are a combination of hearing loss and vision loss uh, causes. All the skin diseases here, dermatitis, acne, psoriasis, urticaria, scabies, uh, but also migraine headache coming up as an important contributor. And then diseases that uh, have a combination of mortality but also a very substantial amount of disability like diabetes or COPD, uh, epilepsy. If we now move, instead of looking at the global picture, let me show you what results are for South Africa. So you see still a large contribution of the non-communicable diseases, but uh, a, a quite a large contribution in terms of uh, the 
disabling outcomes for HIV, HIV, TB. If I actually go back to 2005, you can see that the uh, contribution in terms of non-fatal outcomes of HIV were a bit less. And uh, if we now move to DALIS, and you can see in 2005, the overwhelming contribution of HIV, uh, which with the introduction of antiretroviral treatment has substantially reduced, but is still you know, one of the major contributors to the burden of disease uh, in uh, South Africa. Note also the large contribution of violence and self-harm uh, in, uh, to the burden of disease uh, in South Africa, as well as maybe easier at a lower level, the road injuries as a, an important uh, contributor. But, you know, South Africa is a place with many aspects to the burden of disease. There's the remaining burden of pneumonia, diarrhea, the neonatal conditions, large extra contribution of HIV, quite large um, uh, burden from injuries, as well as a emerging uh, additional burden on health uh, uh, systems uh, of uh, many of the non-communicable diseases. Um, here is a ranking of the top disabling uh, conditions uh, in the world in 1990 and 2015. And you can see that there's a pretty steady sort of ranking among the top conditions with a little shifting in rank uh, where low back pain is the largest individual uh, disease in 2015 replacing iron deficiency anemia, which has come down a bit in rank, major depression, other hearing loss, neck pain, diabetes, migraine, other musculoskeletal, which is a, a, a residual category with you know, things like shoulder problems, uh, but also uh, SLE or uh, fibromyalgia. So a rather large uh, uh, rest category. And when you look down this list as physiotherapists, then you probably recognize uh, quite a lot of these conditions where you directly are involved in, uh, in providing uh, relief uh, to, uh, to patients, but also uh, the very common uh, conditions that uh, many of your uh, clients uh, are likely uh, to have. Um, Again, if you want, we can look at this uh, for South Africa. There you see that HIV AIDS is the largest uh, contributor uh, in terms of uh, years lived with disability and followed diabetes. Uh, if we actually look at females, um, yeah, in terms of rank, it is at a similar position, but if we look at uh, the rate displayed here, 786 wildies per 100,000, we probably see that it is uh, higher. Yeah, so it's about 30% uh, higher than uh, men. And I think people in South Africa would probably know that uh, uh, obesity is a greater uh, problem in women and uh, hence also diabetes uh, being a more common uh, outcome of that. Now, a way of, another way of looking at this is by looking at how much of outcomes can we predict by common risk factors. And this is the overall picture in the world for the years lived with disability. We know a lot about diabetes, about cardiovascular diseases, uh, obviously iron deficiency anemia. We know what uh, you know, iron deficiency being a risk factor. But there are large parts of the schedule, particularly among non-communicable diseases, where we have very little that explains, say, migraine or Alzheimer's disease. But even you know, the large category of back and neck pain, we explain only 22% of that through occupation and uh, obesity. Uh, in contrast, when we look at the wild owls, 
you can see that a much larger proportion of the mortality experience in the world we can explain by a set of uh, common risk factors. Um, I will leave it with this, uh, but I hope to have at least given you a first uh, glimpse of what the global burden of disease is about and what uh, resource it is uh, for anyone who's interested uh, in uh, you know, global health, whether you're a policymaker, a researcher, or just you know, a member of the general public who is interested uh, in knowing what's going on in health. And uh, there are many, many more uh, interesting things that can be explored on our website. And uh, soon we'll be updating all these figures with our latest year of, uh, of data, which will be released uh, in uh, September. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teo. I've uh, played on the website a lot, and it's a, it's a really great one to, to just get lost in and really see different trends happening. And Teo is going to stick with us through the whole presentation, so there will be a chance to ask any questions later on. Um, I'm going to switch now to uh, Catherine, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about the uh, tools that can be used in physiotherapy. And we've switched over there, so I think we're all good. So I just click on my presentation. Okay, good afternoon and thank you for sticking around to the uh, twilight session. Um, sorry, excuse me. Forgot the glasses. It's very difficult to read without the glasses. Um, I'm going to be looking at information that physiotherapists connect, collect and how it might be used to complement the... Uh, the, the global picture and show that uh, the ICF, what's the down button, down button, the ICF is the tool, uh, the best available internationally endorsed tool for the purpose. So just for a moment, stand up, turn to your neighbor, or if you're very isolated, have a big think by yourself about these three questions. What information do you collect who uses that information and what is that information used for? Just a couple of minutes just to bring data to your, uh, from your setting. a little bit closer towards him, towards you. Mm -hmm. Around a little bit. I've changed the position of the mic, Teo, so hopefully that should be a bit better. Just let me know. Okay, I hope that's brought the topic of data to the top of your heads and your orientation. So now if you'd like to take a seat again, I'll move on. Right, so what information do you collect? If you're a clinician, you might have discussed uh, collecting information for a record of care, including medical legal reasons. You might have talked about treatment planning, uh, selecting, prioritizing, and monitoring interventions for decision support, for monitoring quality of, your, of the care you provide, for outcomes monitoring, 
for planning the choice of outcome measures to track changes and to follow people across settings, and for communication with other health professionals, uh, of not just professionals, other health uh, personnel. If you're a manager, you might use the same information, aggregated and organized, to look at scheduling. Have you got the right physiotherapists in the right place at the right time for your uh, acute care, your um, more chronic care in communities versus acute settings? Uh, you might use it for resource allocation. Um, are your funds in the right place at the right time? Um, you might use it for performance monitoring. What are the outcomes that this group of physiotherapists get in this setting compared to an equivalent setting in another town, for example? Uh, you might use it for performance, um, for target setting. Am I seeing the right uh, enough people of this particular type from the communities? For billing and for statutory reporting to health administrations. If you're working in a Ministry of Health or the government, you might use data from the services, again aggregated, uh, for uh, knowing how many people there are with what functional limitations and what sort of services are needed. You might look at service outcomes. You might look at met or under, under met, unmet or undermet need for the services you provide in your jurisdiction. And you might look at equity and access. And governments might use the data for evidence-informed policy and resource allocation. If you're a researcher, you're really looking at what works, for whom, for developing theories, and for comparing research results. And if you're a person with a disability or a functional limitation, patient groups, disabled people's organization, you might look at the data if published, and that's an important point, data needs to be published. How many people like us are there? What type of functioning profiles do we have? What types of services are needed? Who are getting those services and who's not getting them? So think about your data and how it might be aggregated, organized, and used for multiple purposes. There's a rule in data, collect once, use often. And I hope to see a lot of t-shirts with this message. As we've seen from Teo's presentation, the patterns of disease and disability today are changing. They have long latency, high prevalence, high impact. But while mobility, mo mortality and morbidity have a part to play in health information systems, they do not give the picture of how people are living with their conditions, often over many years from the time of diagnosis to the time of the real impact on uh, when they really require uh, health services. So physiotherapists can contribute to the health information systems, providing summary information on, on the person's level of functioning, and including, importantly, the environmental factors affecting that functional performance. Patterns of service delivery today are increasingly focused on the whole person. They're focused on the environmental impacts on functioning. They're community-based, primary care, preventive, collaborative, not just the therapist and their patient, but professional teams and per people and their uh, nearest and dearest around them. And they're increasingly technological. So the ICF model is integrative, not medical or social. And the designers ICF in the 1990s considered these factors in bringing the so-called medical model and social model together. The medical model views disablement as a personal problem, directly focused by disease, trauma, or health conditions. The social model, on the other hand, sees the issues as mainly a societal problem with a view of integration of persons with disabilities into society, and disablement considered not an attribute of the person, but a complex collection of conditions many of which are created by the social environment, the so-called so social determinants. Sorry. 
So hence the management of the problem requires social action and physiotherapists have a part to play in advocating for the people they see. The issue is therefore an attitudinal or ideological one which requires social change. So what are the reasons for measuring functional status? We need to look beyond uh, the diagnosis to measure the health gain. So as you can see, um, so it's well known, sorry, lost my place. It's well known in disability and rehabilitation circles that diagnosis is not sufficient to inform the complexity of the situation of a person with a health condition in terms of needs for interventions, costs or outcomes. For example, the diagnosis stroke only gives something of the etiology and structure affected. We know nothing about the way the person experiences living with the acquired brain injury, whether speech is affected, organizational skills, mobility, whether the person has the support of others or the necessary environmental accommodations to continue to work. In the case of Mr. J in this uh, slide, diagnosis alone is not to sufficient, sufficiently sufficient to inform the complexity of the situation of this person with HIV. But functional status information and associated environmental factors are essential for determining the broader social needs of the person, such as the provision of assistive technology, or for Mr. J, that stigma is the barrier to employment. But why classify? These are two perspectives from people who are involved in developing the ICF. First of all, thinking about functioning and disability uh, has cha was changed by ICF. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, the World Report on Disability, the later one on Health and Aging, together with their global action plans, and most recently the Rehab 2030 um, campaign, all have been influenced but by, the, uh, by the ICF thinking. There is an update process, but also the ICF has been changed by what has happened in that environment. And there is an update process, so you can influence the way the ICF looks. And anyone interested in involving themselves in updates can contact me later. Secondly, the per perspective of a person with severe disabilities, Rachel Hurst from Disabled Peoples International, she said, in a perfect world, we would have no classification. However, for the purposes of statistics, assessment for services and programs, and above all, for non-discrimination le legislation, we do need to have a definition of who we are and of our situation. And lastly, order and master classification are the beginning of mastery, whereas the truly dreadful enemy is the unknown. Organizing information assists with our knowledge. I liken classification to how information is reported not to, uh, in a ward round. We summarize our information and report it to the other uh, people in that ward round. So we have to communicate concisely uh, to the range of other health personnel. In teaching about ICF over many years, one of the big issues is what is the relationship between assessment and classification. Assessments are for a particular purpose. They're often deliberately narrow. They may be profession-focused, disease-focused, setting-focused, focused on a particular time in the course of a disease um, pathway. The Rehabilitation Measures Database lists 383 measures. Is there another set for primary care, for acute care, for specialists, in this, that, and the other? How do we make sense of the data out of all of these individual measures? The ICF provides an organizing framework and set of codes to relate data from different sources. ICF places assessment in context of the broader classification and may show what is being missed. ICF, importantly, does not classify people. It classifies the components of health, so can help overcome the resistance of people with disability to being labeled and classified. So the ICF, I'm sure you're all familiar with this model, 
can be seen as a meta map over the top of existing tools so that a summary measure may be established by rolling up uh, the existing tools and into a summary measure. Some assessments have or will be rethought in line of the, uh, to be uh, ICF compatible. Or we may collect, des design a new minimum data set to gather standardized data on functioning to sit alongside but draw upon existing tools. Again, the designers of ICF have been at the forefront. They put a measure or qualifier of, uh, into ICF to which uh, assessments can be related. Traditionally, the view has been that the person is either disabled or not, a dichotomous view of the world. The world through, viewed through ICF is that functioning is on a continuum along which any one of us has the ability to function at a greater or lesser extent. It's a universal phenomenon. It is societies that decide where on the continuum the cut lines are for eligibility to and access to services. The single domain example shows uh, seeing and the cut lines that might be sensible for particular services. The vector model on the right shows that it is possible to take the individual domains of functioning and statistically form an overall measure of disability. However, my next t-shirt, don't forget the environment. We all know that uh, a, fun a level of functional status exists in a context, and it's important to record the environment as well as the functional level. The ICF recognizes that all people wish to participate in all life areas, wherever they are on the spectrum of uh, functioning and disability. Measurements of participation should relate to all these life areas, and the environments must be invalid evaluated in terms of how much they facilitate or are barriers to this participation. So ICF is compatible with a range of assessment approaches, psychometric measures, clinical interviews, direct observation, self-report, specific assessment procedures that may vary by profession, setting and purpose, and also clinical judgment related to the evaluation of a particular person in a particular context. Methods have their strengths and weaknesses. If more than one method is used, it is possible to overcome the inadequacies of a single method. However, data must be relatable. That is based on a common conceptual framework and using comparable concepts and language. And the ICF presides, provides such a tool and Theo, thank you for the link that uh, you need uh, good definitions to make the GBD data more effective. Um, and so for an example, the Australian Census has included a disability question, on dis uh, a disability question since 2010. The disability survey from 1987 has been based on ICF and its predecessor classification. There is a disability module, similar to the um, census question, which is including national uh, surveys, generic surveys, such as the National Housing, Social Housing Survey last year. Um, the disability services collection includes, uh, is for all government funded services for people with a disability, includes all nine chapters of the activities and participation life areas from the ICF. It is the fact that ICF concepts and definitions underpin all these collections that means that data are relatable and new information can be generated. Studies of un- and undermet need for disability services using survey and services data, uh, so data representative of all people with disability and data from those receiving services, was used to inform governments, resulting in increased expenditure on disability services. Inclusion of the disability module in the social housing survey enabled um, an estimate of one in three households had at least one member needing assistance with self-care, movement or communication, 
which is the de Australian definition of someone eligible for disability services. So now I'm going to move on to some of the tools that are available to assist in application of ICF. So first of all, the Washington Group have devised uh, a small set of six questions uh, to uh, monitor disability in censuses and surveys internationally. So hearing, seeing, mobility, uh, self-care, communication, and understanding. Um, so secondly, the, um, the WHODAS-2 is a generic instrument for uh, measuring health and disability, both at population level and in clinical practice. It has um, six domains of life. It's based on the ICIDH initially, and now the ICF. The ICIDH is the prede predecessor classification. Um, however, it's only suitable for adult populations. It's available, it, the advantages of the HUDAS is that it's a generic instrument, can be used across all diseases, including mental, neurological, and addictive disorders. It's short and easy to use. It has 12, 24, and 36 item versions, so it can be, ranges from five to 20 minutes. Um, it produces standardized di disability levels and profiles across cultures and all adult populations. And it has the direct link to the ICF, so for relatable data. So three modes of am administration and three version lengths. Recently, uh, the WHO has um, developed and pilot tested a model disability survey. So this is for uh, countries that don't have disability services, surveys, sorry, and the items are selected from the ICF. It's used for understanding how people live their lives and uh, the key barriers to full participation. A more clinical tool is the ICF checklist, which was developed in 2001 and has been used in research and in clinical, um, clinical use. Um, it takes uh, 144 major categories from the ICF. It's a practical tool, but the research suggests that the checklist may be too long for some clinical and research purposes, and the, the qualifier a uh, full ICF qualifier may not be all that reliable in clinical situations. In Germany and Switzerland, the ICF core sets were developed. They are subsets of ICF developed for a particular, with a particular research methodology for specific health conditions or specific contexts. They initially focused on high prevalence and high impact conditions such as the NCDs, heart disease, obesity, stroke, osteoarthritis, low back pain, chronic pulmonary diseases, for example. So if a person has a specific disease, a core set might be a good starting point for using the ICF. But it's important to recognize that don't, people don't usually come with a core set. They come as their individual uh, situations. Other subsets have been developed for other purposes. But for example, a core set for osteoarthritis, uh, there is a brief core set and a longer core set. And these are the body functions with three for a short set, body structures with three for a short set, activities and participation life areas with three for a short set, and environmentals with four for a short set. So it can be a very short introduction, which you might want to use as a minimum data set for uh, information arthritis, but I suggest you will need many more to describe an individual person. From the core set work, uh, there was a statistical exercise to derive uh, a generic core set across all um, conditions, and this is that generic core set. It was based on modeling rather th and statistics rather than clinical application. So again, a very short set, but it leaves out um, p 
people who are not in your remunerative employment, uh, so children, the elderly, the unemployed, are excluded from that corset. The linking rules were also developed in uh, Germany and Switzerland, and they are a means by which to relate uh, an, an assessment tool to the ICF. They've been well researched and published, and I suggest that um, you refer to the original sources for the methodology if you have a tool that you wish to link to the ICF. Most recently, the WHO has uh, produced CBR indicators. These are um, capable of capturing the situation of people with disabilities who live in the community where CBR is implemented. There's a guide um, to how to use it and how to uh, manage the data. There are a short set um, of 13 or a more extensive set of 27. Like selecting from a Nazi Padang, depending on the taste and hunger of, of the users, the CBR indicators may, users of CBR indicators may select those that match the specific CBR goals and strategies in the community. There's an Android app and an instructional instructional video on how to use the CBR indicators. For broader application, the University of Sydney has developed the manual and menu for monitoring CBR in community-based rehabilitation, but also in other community-based inclusive programs, so slightly broader use. So the manu manual tells you how, and the menu gives suggestions of data items that you might wish to use. So with these tools in hand, physiotherapists uh, may well be able to produce the data that links, with, uh, links the ICF and creates related data. So it's, there are three key messages, three T-shirt messages. So it's the ICF that is the basis of all those data capture tools. And by using the ICF, the potential to relate data across services, countries, and over time will be enhanced. Physiotherapists generated functional status data through aggregation and relating data sets might inform how people are living their lives with health conditions to complement data on how they are burdened by or dying from diseases. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I really appreciate you being here. When I look around, I remember a colleague of mine up in Zimbabwe saying he gave a talk at about the same time, sort of at the end of a very long day. And one by one, people left until there was just one person left. And he said, you know, I really appreciate you staying till the end. And the man said to him rather glumly, I have to, I'm the last speaker. So. <laughs> So, I really appreciate you being here. Um, so, oh, how did this happen? Did I push the button? There we go. Got it. Thank you. Um, so, I, I, Theo gave the wood. I mean, what more than the wood? Only Theo and his team and Christopher Murray and what have you would have the how can I put it, the chutzpah, to go and actually produce something for all the world, all the conditions, all, all genders, only two, but maybe they'll have to think of other genders now. But it's, it was an enormous big undertaking. What I'm more concerned about is what you on the ground can actually do. So I'm going to look maybe not even at the trees, but more at the twigs if we compare to what Theo did. So... Why am I doing this is because I think as physios, we know that health rationing is on the cards. I don't think if you're in a high income or low income, it doesn't matter where you are, you know that you've got to fight for resources. And the important thing, and this is the message that I want to give to you, is that the services that we provide, health services, are unique because very often it's not the person that you treat who pays for the services. So there's a paymaster, there's somebody else. And this could be the Department of Health, it could be 
medical aid societies, depending on which country you come from. So it's not enough just to say to our patients, our clients, we can do this and make you better. They might be very enthusiastic, but what about the paymasters? Are they going to employ us so that we can provide that service? So what I'm going to do this afternoon is I'm going to present just two case studies because time is limited. And the first one is I want to highlight how if we're going to persuade people that we're needed, we should actually respond to a felt need of the stakeholders. So how can we collect routine data? And the example that I'm giving you is through an academic and clinician partnership. What is the possibility of doing this? So in other words, what is the need that is felt by the stakeholders, the paymasters, and how we could respond to that? And then the second part is, how do we actually speak the language of the people who pay? And in order to do that, we need to think about generating comparable data for cost utility analysis. So the first example that I want to give is the establishing and monitoring of a service. And this was had a lovely start, and it's a very South African sort of flavor. The Western Cape Forum for Intellectual Disability took the South African government to the Cape, uh, Western Cape High Court because it was providing social services and health services to children with severe and profound intellectual disability, but it wasn't providing education. And the ruling was that actually all children were entitled to education, not only medical services, and the Western Cape Education Department, WCED, they had to report back. Not only had they to provide services, but they needed to report back to the court on the progress made in this regard. So as a result of this, four multidisciplinary teams were appointed and employed, and they had OTs, speech therapists, physios, teachers, and they were expected then to deliver services through the special care centers where the children were based. Now, the court, of course, was clever because they said, you have to tell us what progress you made. So as a result of that, the, um, the, the team approached us, the UCT Physio and the Disability Studies Division, and they said, please, can you help us in setting up a, collab um, um, a mechanism for monitoring? And I've highlighted the beginning bits because this is the general thing that is important. Collaboration between clinicians and academics is very important. The next thing is that we were able to get funding from the Cape Consortium for Higher Education and the Western Cape Government Division and the Physio Division. So the second thing is that it was funded. So our, uh, the, 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 the process of developing a monitoring tool was funded. Then we involved stakeholders. I'm a bit embarrassed when I see what I said here. I, I've said the stakeholders here were actually the physiotherapists and the multidisciplinary team. I have to admit we didn't involve the children and their parents. So I'm a bit embarrassed as I stand here. Okay. Then what we wanted was we needed to standardize data collection. There were four different teams working in different parts, some in the rural areas, some in Cape Town, and we had to find some way of standardizing the data. And then, so we then developed a common database. And the process was to say, what information can we routinely collect? And we then pilot tested it. So what is important here is that as academics, we were responding to a felt need by government. Government did put some funding towards it. We were able to get other funding, and we then could work on standardizing data collection. So we didn't do any fancy research projects. What we did simply was to develop a database, but we did it properly, I think. So at the end of the day, we had a whole list of items which were included in the Alpha database, and it was piloted on 134 children. Um, the way in which it was collected was through paper records. And has anyone here used Magpie or SurveyMonkey for data collection? 
where we use that. And I see now that they've got brought out this district health information system too, which has some sort of reporting mechanism built into it. So I think it would be a very useful tool for the gathering of the data. Um, because it's one thing to collect data, it's quite another to put it together and to analyze and to dis disseminate it. Um, so we did this and now I just want to say this was a bit of a, a downfall, as my students say, a bit of a challenge, was that we actually had to have an externally funded research assistant to enter the data. So this means that the system wasn't actually um, self-sustaining. So that, that was a weakness, a downfall. Anyway, after we did that, we pruned items and then we added others. And what did we get? We got a lot of useful information, not only about the tool, but also about the sort of conditions that they were seeing. And why we piloted it is because if people are collecting information, they want to know what it's going to be used for and why is it useful. So just to give you an example of some of the things we found out, that of the 164 children with severe and profound intellectual disability, 10% had, had epilepsy, which implies that there needs to be some medication administered in the centers, and how and who is going to do that. Most of the children tested five on the class, sorry, the majority of children who were tested five on the classification systems, so we included the um, gross motor function classification system, the MAC, which is classification of upper limb, and the communication classification system. Um, but the majority of the children who were tested scored five on, the, on these items, which meant that it wasn't going to be enough just to have a physio or an OT or communication scientist. So this was then very direct information to feedback. The Western Cape Education Department actually you need a team. Then it was followed up by validation studies, and we had chosen something called the P scales, which is an educational outcome measure. And we had to make sure that, in fact, children, it was reliable, but also did it pick up when children improved. And this was very important because there had been a perception that the, ch the children with such severe disability wouldn't improve at all. So we could actually prove, and there you can see, I won't go into it too much, but this, uh, from the first to the second administration, which was about six months or a year, you can see there's a definite shift. So the blue was the first, and you see them moving up towards the second, and then we have children actually moving up to 12. Um, so we did statistical analysis, but that just gives you an idea that there were a lot of children who actually did move up. Not all, but some. So we also then did analysis to say, we did logistic regression, and what was the odds ratio, what were the chances of children improving? And so we found, and unfortunately they weren't statistically significant because the confidence intervals were so big. But we could see that Number four was more than 12 visits by a team. And they were about 1.75 times more likely to improve. If they had multidimensional intervention, so in other words, if they didn't just have physio or just have OT, they were more likely to improve. If they didn't have much mobility impairment, they were the ones who were likely to improve. And whether or not they had chronic illness didn't make any difference. So again, by doing something like this, we know that um, correlation does not imply causation, but it does show which children showed improvement and maybe where we could channel either uh, channel rehabilitation rather than maintenance. So it would help us to say, right, 12 visits by the team did result in improvement. Then very important is what did we do with that data? we then distributed it. 
and we distributed it to the paymasters, the Western Cape Education Department. We had a paper, and we've used this model to monitor at Red Cross Children's Hospital. They've got a child's radio, and they want to monitor what the impact is. So we've used the same model of building up a database that is routinely filled in by the therapists who are busy with the children so that we can monitor to a snapshot what have we got here, and what sort of changes do we have? So what were the lessons learned? Stakeholders identified the need for information. Standardization was possible. The engagement with therapists was very important because the items that were chosen were items that they felt were important. Something else that was interesting and important was we registered the database with the ethics committee, which means that we can use that data for research, and that we know that right from the beginning, the informed consent process is well monitored. So that was important. And then this has allowed us to do more formal research over and above the specific um, routine data. Okay, negatives problem with compliance, they're so busy, we know therapists are so busy. We did need to have an externally funded, so it wasn't quite part of the system to gather the data and analyze it. Not all of the information was reliable, but I particularly say the medical condition, but that meant that we knew that that needs to be stepped up and improved. And as yet, there's no mechanism for routine feedback. Um, but the conclusion is, if anybody is going to embark on the process of collecting data, you don't want to frustrate your therapists. You must make sure that there are adequate resources allocated. You've got to make sure that somebody is going to collect it, analyze it, feed it back. It should ideally be incorporated into an overall data collection system. So we need to institutionalize whatever data we get. So we're hoping that this information will be joined, put in CMIS, which is the Educational Management Information System. Can it be made mandatory? The ICD is mandatory in South Africa. ICD data is collected on every patient. What about functioning data? And then there should be regular feedback on the ground, generating the routine data, as well as to the therapist, as well as to the paymasters. Okay. Um, I'm still okay. I've still got five minutes. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go through the next quite quickly. And that is that we need to speak the language of the paymasters. And this is an example of NICE, which is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. And what I want to put, point out here is this is the management of arthritis, of osteoarthritis. And they have made suggestions as to how to treat it pharmacologically and how to treat it non-pharmacologically, including physio. They're prepared to pay for this. On what grounds did they decide that they would pay? They use basic cost utility analysis. Theo talked about DALIs. DALIs have a specific disability weighting that is generalized. Qualies are usually generated from the individual person themselves. And what is interesting is the NHS um, uh, says that if you can save one quality adjusted life year, it's worth 20,000 pounds. So they're prepared to pay £20,000 to improve somebody's quality of life so that they have one full year of full health. So that's a very useful metric for us to be aware of. Okay? So we know that evidence-based practice must be the cornerstone of physio. But, and I'm not saying in any way that we shouldn't be using all of the, the measures that Catherine mentioned, but the point is that may not mean very much to people who want to know how much is it actually worth in terms of quality of life. Um, we use a lot the EQ5D, which is a simple measure of health-related quality of life. And it uses a preference weight or disability weight, as um, Theo mentioned. It's very simple. 
It has five dimensions with three or five levels of problems. And there are other measures that you could use, but NICE actually uses the EQ5D. And you can use it every day in your practice, because look what it looks like. Mobility, no problems, some problems, a lot of problems. Self-care, usual activities, pain or discomfort, feeling anxiety or depression. How long does it ask, take you to ask your patients that? And then there is also a visual analog scale. What is special about the EQ5D, as I've said, is that there are these disability weights or preference weights. And each one of the health states has a value. So, for example, oh, we'll do this one because we can read it. If you have some problems with mobility, some problems with self-care, some problems with usual activity, some problems with um, anxiety and depression and severe pain, can you see what it is? Yeah, you, you, you lose 0.918 utility. So your life, one year of life in that state is worth 0.082 years of healthy life. Okay, and then you can multiply that with how long you're in that health state, and then you have the number of qualities. So if we could reverse the situation, we would save per year 0.918 utility, and NICE would maybe give us then 18,000 pounds. Okay, we're speaking their language, and it works. We used it for HIV when we did the um, initiation of antiretrovirals. And you can see this was the baseline. These were people who, um, a reference group. And you can see within one month of getting antiretrovirals, we had that amazing picture of Catherine. And you can see how that young man would have gone from there all the way up to that after 12 months. And that can then be calculated. How many qualities did he gain? Um, we've used it as an outcome measure in um, studies we, on, on um, cognitive behavioral therapy in patients with musculoskeletal pain. One found you gain 0.12 qualities. The other found that you gain 0.3 qualities. Um, and we've also used it in population-based research. This is Soraya Marth's work. Um, and this... Just again, I want to highlight, this was actually commissioned by the Department of Health of the Western Cape. So again, the principle of responding to a felt need is quite important. We use the Washington Short Group, we use the EQ5D, and when we calculated the years of healthy life lost, you can see that, and again, this mirrors what Theo was saying, but we can see how many years were lost due to communicable diseases, sorry, non-communicable, but we can see that the trauma intentional, the red one is um, an urban, low-resourced area. The blue is the um, uh, peri-urban, uh, sorry, rural area, and you can see how the urban area had so many more healthy years of life, uh, healthy years of life lost. Okay, dissemination, we disseminated it. And results can be used as a basis for resource allocation and to inform burden of disease studies because we used a generic measure, qualities. So the conclusion is that we need to respond to felt needs and provide good evidence that it makes sense to invest in physios. Clinicians should be um, supported by academics and researchers. We need to speak to the language of decision makers and paymasters, and as far as possible, we should work towards the, fun uh, the inclusion of functional and quality information in routine information systems. So it's not enough that physios be moved by statistics, as we all are, but we need to move the decision makers as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the speakers, Teo, uh, Catherine, and Jennifer. Uh, fantastic stuff. And now I really want to hear from you. We've got about 15 minutes left, just under. So really want to get some thoughts, reactions from you. If you ask a question, I'll, I'll repeat it back again, just because Teo here um, is, is on a separate microphone loop. So I'll have to repeat that back. So if you could keep the questions or comments relatively short, it gives me a, a bit of a chance to reflect them. Is it? 
Is there a microphone somewhere? Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Cecilia, I'm from Sweden. Uh, thank you very much for these nice presentations. Uh, I'm curious to know a little bit more about the development of the ICF, uh, especially in terms of the personal factors. Is that something that you're going to um, uh, look into when you make the update? Um, the ICF was developed with an international collaborative process involving something like 94 countries and 1,500 people, including people with disabilities, um, care organizations, patient organizations, uh, statisticians, health professionals, um, across the range. So an international collaborative effort. The model was developed over time from a linear model of impairment, disability, handicap, to include environmental and personal factors within the model. The environmental factors classification was developed uh, under the co-chairs, one of whom was the person, the person who was quoted, Rachel Hurst, and the other was Janice Miller from the Canadian uh, Center, uh, collaborating center with WHO. The personal factors were extensively debated in the development process. And it was agreed that personal factors could be used to stigmatize people with disabilities. And also, there's a great deal of variation in the way that personal factors are expressed. And that this meant that there was not likely to be an international consensus of what should be included in personal factors. This doesn't mean to say that personal factors shouldn't be collected. After all, you collect a person's name, their date, their occupation, their education level, but they're not defined specifically because we name them differently. For example, I'm working in Indonesia. Most people only have one name. A lot of people only have one name, not a forename and a surname, family name, after name. So defining those would be very difficult. And it was on the grounds of the potential of using them for discrimination that it was decided not to develop it at that time. Last week, there were uh, discussions of the uh, WHO network of class uh, for the family of international classifications, and the issue of personal factors was raised again. There is a consideration that there will be a statement made about the nature of personal factors and how they can be addressed. Uh, you can look in your national collection for how a national collection defines. So you have national data dictionaries or a defined way in which you specify uh, personal factors. So that's the, the place to go now. For international comparisons, then there's more work to be done. But it's still on the horizon, but it will it is unlikely they will be classified and defined, but there may be a statement about how personal factors can be addressed in the situation. Thank you. Shall I just say Theo is still online, so if you have a question about the global burden of disease work. Could we uh, switch the screen so that we can see Theo up there? Oh, there we go. Hi, I'm Arna from Iceland. Um, thank you for a very interesting presentations, and I especially like the emphasis of the dissemination of the data and the analytics and the reuse of data once collected. Um, there are many things that come to mind, uh, the importance of presentation of the data, as Theo showed us. But um, I work a lot with data, uh, so uh, just a comment for the panel. Um, uh, regarding data is what, what it can tell you and it's important to also be very specific of what it does not tell you um, and um, so you don't misuse the data and also um, a thought that came when I was sitting listening to you is that do you think it would be possible to create an information model 
for like uh, f uh, physiotherapy regarding the data that we want to accumulate, something that the WCPT could possibly do. Um, it's so that on a global level, we uh, all physios are collecting similar data. So can I just repeat that so Teo can hear? Can you hear me okay, Teo? Okay, great. So the, the question, and uh, correct me if I, if I was wrong, there was two parts. One was um, it's great statistics and data are great to show what is happening, but it doesn't necessarily show what, what isn't and what does it miss. And the second is creating a sort of center. How useful would it be for all of physiotherapy to collect a sort of central repository of data that we can all use together? And that would be an interesting question to pose to you, that if there were such a thing, how would that be useful for the work that you're doing on the GBD? Uh, uh, what I was talking about was the information model. It's not uh, creating a database. Okay. It's more of a uh, the conceptualizing of what kind of data do we as the physical therapy profession want to aggregate. Okay. So it's, a, it's more of a conceptual model of what kind of data that we do want to aggregate as physiotherapists, as a global body of physiotherapists. It was for the panel. Oh, any of you? Sure. that. Yeah, I think we can hear you, Teo. Okay, so um, we do make use of a lot of administrative records, as I said, from, you know, regarding health service encounters in outpatient departments, in, uh, uh, in patient uh, episodes. Difficulty, though, with using the data is to realize how representative it is of the population for which we're trying to make a measurement. And so if there is a way that we can understand the value of these health service records relative to what the true occurrence of the disease or the true severity pattern of disease is in the whole population, then uh, you know, we make a, a, a thankful use of, uh, of that information, particularly because it can cover uh, countries and years of, uh, of, uh, of estimation for which we don't have uh, alternative uh, sources. But uh, a critical thing is that what we want to measure sh should be representative uh, for a whole population and not uh, a subset of people who, who happen to be in contact uh, with, uh, with the health services uh, only. Okay. Jennifer's just going to add something. Thank you for that, Teo. Um, thanks. That was actually very good, uh, a very good and very difficult question to answer. I don't think the information model is too much of a problem. I think the information model would most probably be ICF, but we know that it's a classification. It's not a, a an assessment tool. And having tried hard to try and get standardised uh, national data or even provincial data. It's extremely difficult at a country level, never mind at a national, I mean, an international level. And, you know, I go back to my little grassroots experience of at least having a standardized data set within the place that you work. So, I mean, I would ask how many physios or fill in the same information about every patient. And I think we need to actually start there. And there are great areas, I mean, there are places which have a lot of experience. So I think that's one of the things. And the other is, when you talk about this, you, there, there's obviously condition-specific as well as generic. And I would imagine you'd be talking more about generic measures. But the generic measures give you different information, and they're not as useful for treatment planning as condition-specific. So it's a really complex question. And I think those are the issues that we need to think about, the standardization within our workplace, what condition specific and what generic, which could be used across different sectors as well, schools as well as hospitals. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for a very 
very interesting uh, talks here. I'm Thomas Mayerbo from uh, Denmark. It's just been suggested to add functional uh, codes to the ICD. This might change the data on function, but it's very difficult without standardized outcome meshes. So would it be would we be able to collect data on functioning, saying walking and learning and so on, without standardized or um, without uh, specialized uh, outcome meshes uh, in in different mm, different rehabilitation sets and different rehabilitation different countries and diagnoses? Uh, what would you think about that? Could I, Catherine, could I ask you to come and answer here? Because I think Teo's. Uh, Teo, the question was about getting standardized um, functional measures across countries, um, particularly in relation to a functional set that's, that's coming into the ICD. And Catherine's going to answer, and she'll come by the microphone here. Thank you. Um, I, th I think my message might not have got across because it's the relationship between assessment and classification. We can assess with many different tools. Walking is walking, it's well defined, uh, or we, if we use the common definition, it's defined. But how we measure it, whether it's a you know, 10 meter length or a two minute length, um, you then need to create rules between that to aggregate to a common code that is walking. So there's work to be done to look at the relationship between the assessment and the classification. In Canada, the, and much as Jennifer did with her study, in Canada, a group working with children with disabilities in the health system and in the education system created a summary measure for referral between the two. They did, as Jennifer did, select the codes that were most relevant for the population, which were, was between infancy and 18, so a broad span. And then they defined the qualifiers of ICF in relation to what, how they'd code the, that five-point scale. So if you're using an infancy scale for, uh, I don't know, mobility, versus an 18-year-old scale for mobility, they could still be aggregated to the same code to provide a message about a, a category that is well-defined with a qualifier that is well-defined. So it was irrespective of the assessment method. So it's about what I was saying, rolling up into the ICF. The ICF is a statistical tool. It's not an assessment itself. Thank you. I hope that sort of. We'll talk later. We've got one last question, and then unfortunately the time is up, so we'll have to wrap it up there. The, the person at the back there. Thank you. Um, my name is Helen Miaswa from South Africa. Hi there, Jenny and Catherine. Um, it, my question sort of follows on to what the first two questions were. Um, and first I'll make a comment is that my experience with working in, um, you know, public health service is that rehabilitation physiotherapy services always had to follow on, if you like, uh, whereas the rest of the services had uh, data sets that were um, designed by experts in areas of statistics and managing data, and therefore nurses and other doctors, they, they could just plug in the information for themselves. But we tend to um, have to do what you did, Jenny, and, um, and therefore we have this variability and we cannot have the data to support policy and to support the services that we require and ultimately to get funding. So this is a wonderful start, but how do we move forward? I know it's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> so Taya, the question, um, if, I, if I paraphrase it a little bit, was more 
the fact that rehabilitation data is not standardly integrated into normal health information where maybe medical nursing data often is, rehabilitation, as Jennifer sort of showed, has to be measured separately. So the question that was asked is, where do we go from here? How do we move forward to get this data that perhaps is, is rich in showing a, the, the, the more complex um, issues that are coming in health right now? How do we move forwards with this? Because rehabilitation has a potentially important set of data to show a different dimension of global health. Jennifer's going to come up and say something. I don't know whether you've got something as well on that too. Yeah. Th thanks, Helen. I mean, it, you know, when we were talking about an international standard, we can't even get a national standard. So, you know, I, I think part of the problem is that we're not used to collecting um, comparable data. It's also not mandatory. And it's also when we collect the data, every now and then, as you know, we had these big pushes to try and get Hurtuskir Hospital or what have you to collect ICF-based data. But unless you have a system to put it together, analyze it, feed it back, the therapists aren't going to do it, and why should they? They're just collecting stuff that they're not seeing anything from. So, you know, I think unless we can actually work at that level, unless somebody is going to be getting the information, making sense of it, and unless it's going to lead to some sort of changes, I just can't see therapists doing it. So I think we really do be, need to be uh, looking at the level of authority, whether it's provincial or whether it is national, or even in one hospital. It needs to be mandatory, it needs to be standardized, and then we can begin to move forward. But you and I know it's, it's very difficult. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Add to that, um, I think you, know, you need to realize that uh, measurements can be made uh, for different uh, purposes. The work that we do in the global burden of disease is directed at saying how big is a health problem? How is it tracking over time? How does it compare to uh, competing demands for resources? Um, an alternative is to look at uh, what progress can you make uh, with a patient through the work that you do through a particular intervention. For that purpose, you would often need far more detailed information than we bring to bear on our global burden of disease estimates, because you need to look at fine differences in health status over time uh, between uh, individuals. So I think it's important to make the measurements suit the purpose uh, that, uh, that you have. On the other hand, uh, we often make use of data that were uh, collected for a totally different purpose and try to make best use of what is available for the purpose that we have with our uh, uh, measurements. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up there. We'll be staying around afterwards if anyone has. Just want to finish by saying, you know, one of the objectives of this was for helping you to review your practice and reflect on, on possible uses of, of data. And um, for me, I, I drew up three recommendations that hopefully we've moved you to go and do. One which is Teo's presentation showing you these amazing visualizations, and I hope you can all go to see these visualizations, test them out for yourself, look at your own country and see if things surprise you. Is it what you thought the picture of health was in your country? And then help to, I think somebody tweeted just now, really helps to make big data understandable, and that's the real value in something like this. The second is thinking about the ICF as the tool. Collect it once um, and use often, and, and looking at does your health system co collect it, and, and, and do you contribute to that? And then third, and I think Jennifer's point about speaking the language of the paymasters, making the connections. We don't have to know all of the tools and all of the research methodologies, but make connections. If you're a researcher, find your local clinic, find your local physiotherapy organization. If you are a clinician, find your local university and see what they can do for you. Partnerships are gonna be key in, in moving this data agenda forward. So thank you very much for listening right to the end and very much appreciate it.